Hello everyone and welcome to this NatSpec TechAbility webinar. Today we're going to be covering an introduction to mental health and technology. I uh, hope you find this as interesting as I have to research it. Um, there's so much to cover. Um, so we'll just give you the starts um, and some kind of um, ideas and some infrastructure on how to use technology with mental health and uh, very keen to have questions. Um, so we'll be taking questions throughout. Phil, um, who's on the line with me, will be fielding those. Uh, you can use the question pane um, on your right hand side. And the handout is in the handout section and we'll also email out the handout. And this webinar will be available on our YouTube channel as well. So mental health and technology we're going to cover today um, a kind of scope of what this what mental health covers we're going to talk a bit about the background of kind of mental health and how it affects people with disabilities and people from different groups we're going to look a little bit at online safety we can look a little bit at screen time and then we're going to focus in on some tools for self-care and social support if you've got any comments today um, feel free to tweet us at tech underscore ability one we'd love to hear how you found it and if you're going to use any of the tools that we've recommended so i didn't want to appear like we were going to be giving um advice that would circumvent that that, that um, individual people are already getting so I, I found this uh, very useful so there's a continuum of mental health um, and this is a, a really useful way of categorizing it where on the right hand side you can see that there is a full clinical disorder um, persistent um, functional impairments um, so kind of high level anxiety panic attacks depressed mood um, all those very serious things and then slightly over to the left um, someone who's injured um, so having a significant functional impairment uh, with anger anxiety lingering sadness tearfulness um, and this is the side of things where an individual definitely has to seek um, and get professional care um, so we're in no way trying to replace that what we're trying to focus on is either complementing that professional care so taking the advice and guidance that those prof professionals are providing or on the left hand side looking more at prevention and self-care and social support um, and this is keeping our learners healthy um, if they are, are already at a kind of um, healthy equilibrium or reacting to common uh, and kind of reversible distress um, and those kind of areas. So as a bit of background, um, we can see that one in 10 children aged five to 16 have a diagnosable condition that moves up to um, kind of one in two of all men mental health problems are established by the age of 14 and three quarters of all mental health problems are established by the age of 24. So given the age range that we're generally working with, we can see that we're on the front line of this and it's a really important time to work with our learners. Um, there is also an age factor. Um, so and a gender factor as well. The one that looks most alarming on the chart on the right hand side to me is um, women between the ages of 16 20 to 24 um, having uh, well, that's a that's a one in four um, having mental health conditions uh, so it's a, a real serious problem with people of our age um, and dropping kind of down the ages that we're working with. So um, as a general prevalence um, in any given week in England, uh, there are 1,800 people that have 
um, are diagnosed with mixed anxiety and depressions, six in a hundred with generalized anxiety disorder, four in a hundred for post-traumatic stress disorder, three in a hundred depression, two in 100 phobias, one in a hundred obsessive compulsive disorder, and one in a hundred people with panic disorder. Um, and this is all taken from the MIND website. Um, I've got the source there in, in the bottom right. Uh, so you can go into more detail and find out more about these individual um, kind of disorders and uh, issues. Okay, um, now this I found quite shocking um, with how many people get treatment. Approximately only one in, oops, sorry. Yeah, approximately one in eight adults with a mental health problem are currently uh, getting any kind of treatment. Um, and the most common treatment offered is psychiatric medication. So I think that makes it even more important that we do as much as we can um, to get people the help and support that they need. Um, there are particular at-risk groups um, specifically looked for this given all the kind of BLM movement at the moment which is so important um, so black or British or black British people 23% um, um, there are um, experiencing a common mental health problem in any week um, and that compares to 17% of white British people um, also the LGBTIQ community um, much higher again um, to have mental health problems. Uh, as we highlighted, young women aged 16 to 24. Um, and there are also overlapping problems with homelessness, substance mi misuse, and contact with the criminal justice system. Now, what they didn't mention on the MIND resource was um, anything about specifically about people with disabilities. Um, but the Foundation for People with Learning Disabilities came through with some really useful information on this. Um, so between 25% and 40% of people with learning disabilities also experience mental health problems. For children and young people, the prevalence rate of a diagnosable psychiatric disorder is 30% in children and adolescents with learning disabilities compared to just 8% of those who didn't have a learning disability. Those are shocking figures. Um, these young people were also 33% more likely to be on the autistic spectrum and much more likely than others to have emotional and conduct disorders. There was a lot more information on mental health and learning disabilities, um, but there are some inf there is some information out there on physical disabilities as well. Um, so people with Down's uh, syndrome um, are particularly high risk of uh, developing dementia with an age of onset 30 to 40 years younger than general population. That's worth considering. Um, and also um, people with learning disabilities are much more likely to le live in poverty um, and to have few friends and additional long-term health problems. So some real kind of wider issues that we need to deal with. So we can't just approach this as a kind of sticking plaster. We have to think of a complete solution. Um, the, yeah, sorry, this is the bit that I was trying to talk about um, with physical disability. So the proportions of people experiencing anxiety or depression increases with physical disability such that 38% of respondents with low and 66.7% with high disability reported at least mild anxiety and that um, rises to 17% um, of people with low and 71.7% with high disability experiencing at least mild depression. Um, so now to talk a little about about some of the kind of issues around technology. So there are some real advantages and uh, as the presentation continues I'll, I'll focus more on those but one of the issues that a lot of people talk about is screen time and um, I notice in the press um, and you may have too that lots of articles are saying how much time our children are spending on screen time and very kind of alarming figures and stats 
But I found this really interesting from Amy Auburn, a psychologist at the Oxford Internet Institute. She's saying that um, there's an important nuance between the different types of screen time that someone's having. So really contrasting the difference between skinny Instagram models that you're looking at on uh, kind of social media, comparing that to Skyping um, kind of your grandmother or chatting with school classmates. Um, and I think today that's what this uh, presentation is going to focus on is, is it's really about how we use that screen time, uh, when to limit it, when to promote it um, and getting a healthy balance. Um, a few tools that you can use um, just to kind of keep um, track of, um, well, to control, uh, self-control your own kind of screen time. Uh, so on Android and Google, um, you can use uh, Google's wind down. Um, this puts your phone in a do not disturb mode. Um, it doesn't allow you to blanket disable most of your apps like iOS does, um, but it does cut out the kind of the notifications, uh, which can be quite intrusive. Um, there's also a grayscale mode. Um, I don't know if anyone's tried that, but in this mode, all the color is drained out from your phone screen. Um, and there are some studies kind of pointing that uh, a lot of our kind of um, kind of stimulation comes from the bright colors on the on the phone. Um, it's no coincidence that lots of the um, kind of app manufacturers look for these kind of bright, colorful um, icons um, and that kind of reward that your brain gets from these small interactions is quite important. So grayscale can be a good way of kind of winding down those. Uh, Apple has its own and that's called Downtime. Um, it allows you to set a few apps that can always be used um, like phone or text messaging app. Um, this is quite common to kind of separate again what are the healthy things to be using and what are the unhealthy things to be using at a particular time and it will block all the others. Now blocked apps can be can still be accessed but they will be darkened on your home screen um, and it will make it harder to use. Um, got some kind of screenshots on the right and it shows you some of the features. Um, so weekly reports, um, setting, as we said, your downtime and app limits. Um, you can also in there have content and privacy restrictions and a screen time passcode as well. So you can lock your kind of um, child's or um, person that you're caring for's device, obviously with the correct permissions sort first. Windows has a system of um, Microsoft family groups. Uh, this is on Windows 10 and it allows you to put everyone in your family or a particular group um, under one digital umbrella. Um, it's managed on the website uh, where you can change the settings and limit screen time for yourself and your children. Um, it's nice and clear and easy to uh, do. It does involve setting up accounts um, for different people. So you have to decide about how much information you're giving with those accounts um, and look at the privacy for those. I'd advise, you know, with anything, look, have a little look at the privacy kind of things. But it does mean that you can uh, filter content, um, you can control spending, you can keep kids safer online and you can set screen time limits. And this also works across for um, Xbox if you're using that too. Another major issue that people talk about is uh, concentration. Now, I'm a little bit worried that I suffer from this too. Um, that moment when you're, you can't just do one thing at once, I have to kind of multitask and I'll be either watching TV and on my phone or I'll be working and then doing emails and kind of getting interrupted. So I'm very conscious of this myself. Um, and the general consensus is that it does affect our brain health. Um, it has both an upside and a downside. Um, the downside being that when people use it all the time, it interferes with their memory because they're not paying attention to what's going on. Um, they're distracted. Um, on the positive side, there are certain mental tasks when using these technologies that exercise our brains. Um, some studies have shown video games and apps can improve working memory, fluid intelligence, problem solving and multitasking skills. Um, I can I can vouch that 
using my dad's computer when I was younger and then breaking it and having to fix it uh, certainly um, improved my problem solving skills. Um, but the the issue is at this point, um, because it's relatively recent that people are using this so much, there aren't there is not much in the way of systematic studies looking at it. Um, so you can only look directly at it. So um, Gary Small, who's um, the author of the, who's the um, person who's created these quotes, he's an author, um, he's director of UCLA's Memory and Aging Research Center. Um, and he's saying that we can only look indirectly at this. So you can study the frequency of memory complaints according to age. Um, and we're finding that 15% of young adults complain about their memory, which suggests there might be going, might be things going on such as distraction. Now, social media, um, when we're looking at mental health, is a huge issue. Um, kind of our, our learners are getting bombarded with all kinds of information, um, and it's a real risk to their kind of privacy as well. Um, just watched The Great Hack recently. I don't know if anyone else has seen it, but that was a, a really kind of scary indication of, of how um, social media can be misused and I think it's worth watching. Um, there's a few minutes afterwards where you're thinking oh, I'm going to delete my account and then you realize it's how I view my cat pictures and share um, holiday photos with friends and family and suddenly that kind of wanes. Um, but I think it's worth being aware of the risk and being aware of how to lock down um, your Facebook accounts. Uh, they have some much better kind of privacy settings um, and the first step is being aware of something before you can control it. There are some really useful online um, safety resources out there so as an organization what people can do is look at a code of conduct and acceptable use policies uh, for students and staff. Um, you can look at appropriate filtering and monitoring um, look at student engagement and reporting as well. So I've put some uh, really useful articles on there um, so that you can look into this further. Um, online safety could be an entire webinar in itself. So we've just kind of given you a start there. Um, if you're really interested in us doing an online safety webinar, we could expand this and maybe look at getting some guests in who uh, specialize in this area. But for now, there's a few links there, one that can that focuses on what colleges can do to protect um, home working students. Um, another one about how your digital policies can support online safety. And then a really useful self review tool as well um, that might be worth uh, kind of sitting down with um, your IT team or leadership and just working through and seeing where you're at. Uh, also, as from a more kind of individual or kind of one-to-one -one view, uh, the NSPCC have some fantastic resources that focus on specific areas. Um, so as you can see from this screenshot, there's things on sexting and tent sending nudes, um, talking to your child about online safety. Um, I think it's really important to kind of know how to start the conversation with your child. Um, talking about online games and live streaming, online apps, online porn. These are all things that might be quite difficult conversations to start off with, um, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be having them. Um, so there's some really useful resources from the NSPCC there. So there's a good uh, resource from the Mental Health Foundation that I found really useful to break down the different things that technology can do um, to help mental health. Now, the article isn't about specifically about technology, but if you've seen us talk anything about um, assessment, what we're looking to do is not just use technology for the sake of it, but actually have a purpose and a real drive for that technology. Once you know what problem you're trying to solve, and you know the learner that you're working with and how they're going to be using this, you can find the apps to match this. So they've got 10 different ways to kind of focus in on looking at your mental health. And I've what I've done is just start to match a few apps that can fit these different areas. 
So first of all, talking about your feelings. Um, so it's a very important thing and, and um, it's the idea that we can, by starting off a conversation and sharing a problem, we it, it, just talking in itself can help these things. Um, it is very difficult and it's worth making sure that your students have an outlet for that, whether that's something within your college, um, a kind of position that they can um, that they can access themselves to talk to a professional, or whether that's through uh, kind of online services or phone services. It's also very important to keep active, um, and that doesn't necessarily mean doing sports. Um, it can be walks in the park, gardening, or housework. So for those kind of things, it's good to get kind of apps that will help with organization. So just a few examples then of things that can help with this. So one thing that helps when it's when you're looking to talk about mental health and how you're doing and how you're feeling is to keep track of it. So the example that I use with um, Dalio is a learner that I was working with who would come to their mental health session every week and they would feel angry or sad or upset but they wouldn't remember why they felt that way and the details things are very vivid in the moment when these things happen or even on the day but then over time um, they can get confused and our brains are very malleable by what's happened in the last few moments so what's good about dailyo is that it tracks your mood um, on a kind of daily like daily basis um, you can say how you're doing um, with good icons so if someone's got any kind of um, difficulties accessing printed materials then this can be quite useful and you can also say what you've been up to again with icons which is why I really like this because it's it's um, an accessible app um, it's got a simple user interface it's available on both Android and iOS um, there's a really good detailed output which I'll show on the next page um, and this can be learner-led or it can be that collaboration with support where the supports are viewing the kind of output of this at the end of the week or the end of the day. Um, if you need more than just tracking um, and you're looking at actually a full support system with a timetable, then it's worth considering brain in hand and we'll discuss that a little bit later. Uh, there are other similar apps, so if you find this one um, isn't right or you're looking for a, a simpler interface, uh, Pixel is a, a really good one and it's just kind of coloured pixels that kind of lay out how you're feeling on particular days. So a little bit less information in, in a um, diagram uh, but could be right for the right learner. And we're talking about the detailed outputs. Um, these are the kind of uh, outputs that you get. So um, as you can see, charts of different types um, and what activities are associated with um, particular moods. You can have a longest best day streak. So kind of really adding a motivation and kind of gamification of trying to improve your own mental health. Um, and you can also keep a track of the activity counts. So if there's a particular week where maybe I haven't been seeing my friends or I haven't been uh, doing sport and that's when I'm down, then I can start to associate these things and we can start to put things in place to help them. So a uh, really useful tool. There are so many fitness apps and the best advice I can give you is, is um, to try and match them to your learners' needs. Uh, Fitness Pal, I just picked up as, as one of the more common ones um, and has a wide range of features. Uh, it's available on Android and iOS. Um, it's got a step counter, so you can link it to your Fitbit, um, which is really useful for students if they just want to kind of um, get their steps in and have a walk around and get around. But it also uh, considers nutrition, uh, so you can put kind of goals around that. Um, there's lots of features which can be a good thing or maybe it's a bad thing depending on the learner, um, depending on what they need. Uh, there's a free version but also some premium options as well. 
uh, there's just to mention something outside of uh, general kind of fitness tools. Um, Down Dog is an app that gives free yoga workouts. Um, it's available on Apple and Android. Uh, you can tailor your workouts. As you can see, you can choose a full practice or a smaller one. You can choose your level. I definitely recommend starting at beginner uh, level first. It's easy to think you're intermediate until you start uh, taking the session. Uh, you can choose the length and uh, more options. So um, choosing the music and choosing what you want to focus on as well. Um, you can favorite your um, the best uh, kind of yoga sessions that you, you've enjoyed the most. Uh, the accessibility is good because it uses videos so you can both see and hear what the person is doing uh, and there are free and paid options for this. Uh, the other alternative for this, especially if you're thinking that the um, the sessions aren't um, aren't what you need or you need something specific, then I'd advise using YouTube and going on and looking for the specific things you want. There are resources on there for yoga for people with disabilities um, and you can kind of helpfully favorite those for your learner so then they can access those in their own time. Another two um, important things are eating well, um, so things around nutrition and uh, drinking sensibly as well. Um, so talking about alcohol kind of levels. Uh, for the drinking, there are again, quite a few different apps out there. So it's worth having a look through them. Um, Drink Coach seemed like a really useful one for me as again, it uses the um, icons and it's a nice, clear, simple interface. Uh, it tracks how you're doing on a calendar. Uh, you can set your own goals, um, meaning um, that, you know, if, if your goal is to have zero alcohol, then you can aim for that. If it's just to cut down, then that also works. Um, it allows reminders at key times um, just to kind of keep things in presence so you can't, so you don't fall into kind of habits. Um, and also has the option for in in app advice sessions, um, which I think is quite a useful feature. And uh, yeah, free on Android or Apple, again, with some kind of premium options, including the online appointments. So for nutrition, um, there are, again, a really wide range of options there. Um, so what I thought it would be useful to do would be to show you the NHS apps library here. Um, so yeah, this is accessible on the NHS website. Uh, I'm just gonna move to sharing my screen. Yeah, go to webinars being quite slow today. Okay, so here we go, healthy living apps. So um, you can filter these out at the top um, by category. Um, so you can focus on lots of different areas there, um, which is pretty useful, um, including learning disabilities, uh, including mental health. So if we apply those filters, then it'll start to give us recommendations on the different apps that we can use and the pricing. Um, so there are so many out there um, and these are really useful because the NHS keeps this list updated. It's worth considering that with um, with these kind of apps, um, they can change over time. So it's always worth reviewing and kind of seeing, is it the same app and is it still used in the same way and with the same support? Um, so yeah, that's that's what I found useful on that. Okay, um, another two ways to uh, look after your mental health are to keep in touch with people um, and to ask for help. Oh. And a really good way of doing this is through the NHS app. Um, so this is available on App Store and on Android. Uh, so Apple and Android um, has advice about coronavirus. You can order repeat prescriptions, you can book appointments, you can check your symptoms, you can view your medical record, register your organ donation decision and find out how the NHS uses your data. 
Now, with any of these apps, um, it's useful to know how to use the inbuilt accessibility features on a phone. That can make the difference between it being accessible or not. So um, I'd recommend if you've got learners with any kind of print impairments um, to just be aware of what features are in the phone itself. Um, if you'd like more information on this, we can, um, if you either put that in the question pane or um, tweet us or drop us an email, we can make sure that we um, provide some specific resources on that. Um, but again, that would be a, um, an entire webinar in itself. Okay, other two ways of looking after your mental health are to take a break, um, and that includes sleep, not just during the day, um, and doing things that you're good at um, and beating stress. So I've chosen to focus on um, kind of taking a break um, for meditation. Um, so this is an example of a meditation app. Um, um, it's called Headspace. Um, what I liked about this is it's free for the unemployed. Um, it has some really good meditation tools and um, can help you just relax. And it talks you through um, and guides you through uh, getting into meditation. Um, there are some other apps as well, and those were listed in the NHS um, tool. So um, it's worth checking out Headspace, but it's also worth checking out some of the other ones. Uh, different people prefer the different apps. Also to mention uh, Sleep Town. Um, so when we were talking about screen time earlier, there were the kind of inbuilt apps, but there's also something encouraging um, some kind of gamification, which means taking a very serious thing and uh, turning it into a game with kind of rewards. So this is about developing healthy sleeping patterns. Um, it's free with some premium options to kind of link with your friends, etc. Uh, there are customizable goals and how it works is that I would set what time I'm aiming to go to sleep and what time I'm aiming to get up. And between that time, if I access my phone, then the house that I'm trying to build won't be built. Um, so um, over time, you'll build up a town, and obviously, the more that you're getting that, that good night's sleep, you get more um, in your town, and you get different options of buildings. Um, I tried this uh, for a week, and um, it was when I had quite a lot of work on, and I did absolutely appallingly. Um, I think I only ended up with a couple of houses. Um, so yeah, um, as with all these apps, it's worth trying yourself. Um, then you can test the accessibility options, and you can know the features and see what's going to work for your learners. Um, it's always good to try things out. So that's really useful for um, sleep patterns. During the day, if you're looking for some kind of gamification for learners putting their phone down for a short amount of time while they focus on another activity, then it's worth considering um, forest. Um, and this does a similar thing but you're growing trees instead. So you set a certain amount of time of how long the tree is going to grow for and if they access the phone during that time, you don't get the tree and you don't add to your forest. Um, there are other kind of inbuilt tools in um, iOS in particular to lock the screen to certain apps as well, um, which can be really useful. Okay, um, also a major kind of part of mental health is um, money issues. Um, this wasn't one of the 10 uh, kind of steps, but I thought it was really important to mention. Um, so I've included an app there uh, called Money Manager, um, and it's a way of um, tracking your spending. Uh, what I liked again about this is it's got clear categories with symbols and color coordinated. It's the kind of app that you can use yourself and then teach to your um, learners and it'll get them to start understanding where their money goes in a week. Um, so this is helpful for so many different learners with learning disabilities or memory issues, um, and it starts to encourage that independence. Um, so another couple of ways of looking after your mental health are to accept who you are, um, that we're all different, um, and be proud of who you are, and um, to care for others. Um, so getting involved with kind of local groups and charities. 
so the um the best way that we can do that is to kind of link our learners with um and kind of um allow them to be social so it's finding kind of online interest groups that they might have um we've got a webinar coming up on thursday that's going to be focused on accessible gaming um so we would love um to kind of link people who want to do some gaming online even if they're complete newbies to it even if they're complete beginners right the way up to people who really enjoy gaming uh, we're going to try and give some different options for them to link socially through kind of gaming sites um, given how many people are sadly um, having to be on lockdown and stay away from people it's a really good option uh, to link with others and without the intensity of uh, video calls um, which I'm sure uh, you're all <laughs> experiencing at, at various points. Um, so that's the end of that article. Um, I've got the source there and um, there's a lot more information in it. The Mental Health Foundation have done a really good job there. Um, I've also included the social media links there um, if you'd like to follow them. Uh, brain in hand is um, worth mentioning because it covers a lot of the different areas that we've spoken about. It works by um, setting a diary of all the activities that you have, and then it breaks these down into individual steps. And then it breaks this down further into the challenges and the problems that you have with those steps. So this is really useful if you've got, already got someone with a mental health support strategy um it will take their current strategies and apply them at the different times that the learners need them so if you're used to working with learners who become completely overwhelmed in the moment or really struggle with remembering in the instant what their issues are then this is a really good way of, of linking that so they've got it with them at all times also has a traffic light system where uh, you can have it so that it will prompt a learner to feedback how they're doing and this can be hourly two hourly it can be however you set it and this will feedback uh, green if they're doing okay amber if they're starting to struggle a little bit or um, showing certain signs of anxiety or depression etc and then red if things are really bad so amber if there's a few different amber um, kind of warnings then it will connect them to a professional or if um, they press red, then it connects them to a professional. So these professionals are different as to what the learner's needs are. If the learner is on the autistic spectrum, then it will connect them with uh, someone from the um, autistic um, uh, foundation um, who's actually trained in working with learners with autism. Or if it's a mental health um, issue then they'll be linked with a call center with people trained in talking people through mental health issues so it's um it's fairly expensive um and how much you pay depends on whether you can get this under current support and what features you use and it's a really useful app and i think the results are probably the most exciting thing in that it gets people out and doing things and it gets people being independent where they previously weren't um, we can't always be with our learners, so it's, it's a good support system um, to help people take those steps forwards. So uh, coming to the end of the webinar, um, so it's a good time if you've got any questions or comments or things that you want to think about. Um, in the meantime, just to kind of link you to a few other useful resources that we've got. Um, so we have got some webinars that are quite um, well linked to this. Uh, we've got one that we've just carried out on assistive technology for parents and carers um, so that can help um, parents and carers with some of these um, tools to help learners at home um, and we've also got a specific uh, one that brain in hand delivered if you're interested in more of that for support for autism and mental health uh, these are all available on our uh, webinar channel uh, which I've put there which is a YouTube link the assistive technology for parents and carers will be going up um, in within the next few days or so, I'd say. And there is also something on social stories, which can help really help learners with anxiety um, to guide them through their day. 
Um, we've also got some support on remote therapy. Now, this was designed with speech language therapy in mind, but there's a lot there that could also um, apply to delivering uh, mental health therapy online. And that's it. So if you've um, found um, this useful today, then please let us know. Follow us on Twitter, email us, um, check out the webinars. And thank you very much for attending. Um, this has been obviously an introduction. There's a lot of other areas that we could have focused on and done a lot more details on, but I just wanted to give an overview of what's out there. So thank you very much. Thanks, thanks Neil. Just before you finish, um, a couple of questions. Um, if anyone's got any more questions, please just fire them into the question pane and then we'll, um, uh, we'll be able to deal with them. But just a question about um, data really and uh, GDPR. So the, um, especially you've been through an awful lot of apps there, but just thinking if we're referring people onto them, does the NHS site have any details on what happens to your data um, and whether, you know, the tracking features on phones and things like that? Is there any information out there on, on that rather than having to go to each individual app? So the 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 website itself doesn't seem to have anything um for um the kind of privacy side of things um they just they just talk about how it works and who it's suitable for um i suppose it's it's almost um it's just a help i suppose to know that the nhs recommended that it's more likely um to be legit um and they do have a review date there um uh but they their disclaimer at the bottom there is the app is developer is solely responsible for the advertisement compliance and fitness for purpose um and then the apps are not supplied by the nhs and the nhs are not viable for their use so i think although they recommend it they're not taking full responsibility so i think that's down to the individual really to to look into Okay, thanks. So it's maybe something we should um, advise people to, if they're recommending apps for um, learners or young people, to look at the terms and conditions and maybe talk with the person about whether they have um, location on at key times or most apps. You can just have location on when the app's running and then it turns off automatically, that kind of thing. Um, yeah, yeah. That's, yeah. that's um, yeah, that's definitely, a, I think, a kind of wider, um, kind of online safety linked um, type webinar. Um, so yeah, that might be worth delivering at some point. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll mm -hmm. line, that, line ourselves up for another one there, but I'm, I'm not really sure it's in our our, um, our ballpark, but it might be something yeah. that we need to uh, point people towards key resources. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's it for questions, unless anyone's type, frantically typing something in. Okay, I think we're there. Great. Well, we'll finish it there. Um, yeah, thanks, Phil. And um, thanks for everyone attending. And uh, yeah, please let us know if you've got any questions or comments. Okay, bye now.